this is Bob Wells here, and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. This is the show where we hear about people's interests and uncover some fascinating stories at the same time. I hope you enjoy today's show. My guest today is the award-winning author, Daniel Lawty. He's the author of the action-adventure series featuring arms dealer Jim Factor, with two books, The Missing Factor and The Business End. He is also author of three historical fiction novels featuring a French knight, Jean de I hope I pronounced that properly, in the Avion Legacy, Knights of Honour and Knights in Action. And he's just released his new book, The Mulligan. Hi, Daniel, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. As you know, I, I'd mentioned that I've just read The Missing Factor, which I really enjoyed. It was a great story, globe trotting, lots of action, twists and turns throughout. I couldn't put it down. No, thank you. It's uh, actually a lot of it is based on my own experience. I, I gather that, yeah. So before we talk about your books, can you tell us a little about the journey to becoming an author, please? Because you clearly have had an action packed career, you know, before as an aerospace engineer working with the Air Force. Well, um, it, it turned out that uh, my basic training, and when I, we'll go back to high school now, and, and I went yeah. to Tokyo school, and at that time, the nuns beated you merciless until you grasped the English composition very well and spelling very well. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. then uh, I took a break. I joined the Air Force and uh, uh, was in the Air Force, and then... Uh, my father had a business, and I participated in that. So I entered the university late in life, uh, actually yeah. at age 26, received my degrees in engineering, electrical engineering, and then went yeah. back into aerospace, where I was familiar with uh, uh, Air Force products, Air Force radars, weapon systems. And that journey took me into intelligence agencies and working for intelligence agencies and then uh, designing and developing radar systems, and, and then actually on contract, flying and uh, implementing them for uh, the Air Force and intelligence. So doing all of that, it required a great deal of writing reports, technical journals, technical articles, and uh, proposals. And so I had a good foundation in writing. It was until I retired that I took it seriously and said, you know, I think I could write uh, a book on my experiences and my where I live yeah. because I lived internationally quite a bit. And yeah. so I started. Uh, it didn't, t- success, success didn't come easy or not even getting an agent came easy. It took me, I was finished with three books before I, an agent contacted me. So that was my journey. And uh, yeah. in the past uh, 15 years, I've uh, written, oh, let's see, seven books now. I'm on my eighth and uh, have published six of them already. And the seventh is at my uh, agent's hands right now. Yeah. And that's my, uh, my long and story. And I must say that having writing, having a writing ability requires a great deal of persistence. In fact, being obstinate, it's got to be one of the requisites of the writing game. Oh, yeah, I, I bet it has. Bet it has. <laughs> when I when I read the um, the missing factor, um, like I say, there, there were lots of twists and turns of plot and everything, um, and I did detect that your obviously there was a lot of your experiences in there in in terms you know the technical side, the globe trotting, and and arms. When you were working for the Air Force. Did you have to go undergo any sort of training at all to, to you know, for them to accept you? I did. Um, I was required, and I, I flew on Air Force missions, uh, Air Force intelligence gathering missions, uh, and it required me to go to survival school and Air Force training and do the whole thing as if I was a pilot or a navigator on an aircraft, and so. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it required me to go to over desert survival school. It, it involved that altitude chamber. It involved parachuting. It involved over water survival. It, it involved Arctic survival. And in fact, uh, I 
took them all in stride and humorously involved. And, and I wrote up a, a little piece on that too, uh, just to satisfy myself about the events that had occurred. Yeah. And I, I thought to myself, maybe someday I'll write a memoir. But then I decided, no, nah, I, I have enough writing to do without switching genres again. And I guess you can use, again, you can use some of those experiences um, to put in your books. I, yes, I, I have. I have uh, actually lived in Kuwait before and after Desert Storm. Oh, really? Uh, I was uh, with the, dealing with the Middle East on business. Yeah. I also uh, then, after that, uh, I, and, and to do that, I lived in uh, Provence, France, uh, Toronto for a spell. I lived in uh, Kuwait. Yeah. And I then moved over to uh, Thailand I, where I lived in Bangkok. And uh, I did the, my my territory for my personal business was uh, the Asian area. Okay, and I noticed that I, I read that you'd been involved with a a twenty twenty person group with um, Bill Clinton. That yes, that was uh, in my experiences. Uh, I've also been president and general managers and vice president of companies. So it turned out that I was. Uh, a uh, president of a company owned by an individual in the Washington, D.C. area. Yeah. And uh, his best friend, or, uh, a good acquaintance, was uh, Mondale. And uh, he got invited to a 20-person committee, and he said, no, wait a minute, I got a better person for that. And you probably know him, and I was a high-profile person at that time. Yeah. I was former. I formerly chief radar engineer for the North of Grumman Corporation oh, really? and with the Defense Department. So they eagerly adopted me or got me on the committee. Yeah. And that was President Clinton. And uh, then I traveled with a group to uh, uh, Belfast yeah. and Northern Ireland and uh, spent two weeks there uh, collecting information, discussing it, even with Sean Finn, who was the uh, the IRA head, and and so um, that was my experiences uh, in politics. And yeah. after that, we feed it to a White House Southern Lawn uh, extravaganza where he displayed his gratitude, and senators and Hillary were there, and yeah. every uh, all the senators. So it was quite an experience, but uh, I was quite uh, happy to leave the politician and the politics behind <laughs> and concentrate on what I was doing. Yeah. One one thing I noticed you, you you've obviously got the um, action adventure things with with Jim Factor going, um, and there, there's two books. Have you have you got third? Is there going to be a third one coming out? Uh, I, I haven't started yet. Uh, I have an idea for a follow on to that, but my agent has been busy pushing me into other areas, and I've been pushing in. Uh, for example, I took a detour uh, this past uh, spring and wrote a, a book or a handbook called The Writer's Toolbox, where articles I've written on writing and, and the genre itself, um, I, I fashioned into a, you might say, a handbook for aspiring and accomplished writers. Oh, right. And that, that book called The Writer's Work Toolbox uh, sits with my agent, who the editors are working over. Um, so that was a detour for me. And in addition... Um, I just I had an idea for another sequel to the Knights in Action, and I'm about two thirds of the way through with that. Uh, after that, I believe I will switch and uh, publish an, a follow up to the Business End. Oh right, okay, yeah, because that that was another thing I noticed. Yeah. I haven't I haven't read the uh, the Knights one as yet. I, I'd like to. Um, it's it's interesting how you've sort of got two different genres going there. How, how easy is that to manage in terms of how, how you write? Uh, you know, I thought it was difficult, but let me tell you how I got into it. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I did write Avignon Legacy to begin with. And then I sent out the query letters to try to get an agent, a literary agency involved. And uh, after not even getting a single response out of over 200 of those letters. Then I decided at that time, about a month after I finished two months, 
that maybe I picked the wrong genre. That was, uh, you might say, a combination of historical fiction and action adventure. So I said, well, let me change my genre. So I changed it. And uh, I wrote uh, that one. Excuse me. I was talking about The Missing Factor was the first yeah. one. The second one, The Avignon Legacy, was historical fiction. I changed the genre. I thought it was going to be difficult, but my forte is research. And I turned out that I was really, really interested in the medieval ages, yeah. the 14th century to be exact. Yeah. So I eagerly started my research, and that led to me doing a premise, to expand it, do an outline, and then coming up with a book. Yeah. Again, finished the book, everything proofed and everything else, sent out the query letters again, over 200, almost, probably almost 250. Yeah. And I did get a couple of rejections, and I said, well, maybe I picked the wrong genre again. <laughs> so I said, I try a fantasy. Yeah. So I wrote a more romantic fantasy called The Mulligan. Is this the latest one that's been published? Yes, yeah. the latest one that's been yeah. published. So that then as I finished The Mulligan and didn't have the manuscript proofed or anything, but it's sitting there on my desk, I received an inquiry Eight months after I had sent one of the letters out yeah. from an agency saying, you know, that sounded rather interesting. Um, why don't you uh, send us the first, say, few chapters and let us go through it? So I did that. And then uh, uh, that was the Avignon Legacy. And then I didn't receive any word for a month. And then I received another query and said, well, how about sending us the manuscript so we can read the, the man, you know, read your novel. Yeah. So I did that. Another month passed. And then I get another email saying, listen, you know, we're interested. Are you represented? Uh, we'd like to represent you. Oh, my God, my heart flipped and I did somersaults and uh, kept a straight face. And I said, no, I'm not represented. And, and I did a little background research on them and it turned out to be illegitimate. Yeah. Uh, literary agency, and I accepted eagerly. And in point of fact, as I mentioned in a couple of my articles, uh, I have that email asking me if I have represented it, uh, representation, and they'd like to do it. I have it framed and hanging in my office. <laughs> like I say, I've I've only read the missing factor, but looking at the the con- you know the books that you've got, they, it, I would have thought that. They make great films or TV programs. Is that is that something that you've never considered? Uh, it it I've been told that, but uh, I haven't pursued it. I quite honestly, I wouldn't know how to pursue no. it. I rely on an agent and a publisher, yeah. and uh, uh, but I just I guess how it happens is that somebody somewhere picks up a novel, reads it, and says, "Hmm, doesn't this sound interesting?" For example. Uh, when you write a book and you present it to, uh, let's say, an, an agency or a publisher, one of the things you put in there is what they call comp titles, yes. Compar- comparison t- titles. In other words, the agent wants to know what publicized or best-selling novels or movies that this is this genre and this adaptation of yours follows or is close to. Yeah. So we have an idea. And so uh, it turns out that, as things would have it, the, uh, the Jean uh, Termont uh, series, the uh, Avignon Legacy, the Knights of Honor, the Knights in Action, actually follow comp titles uh, Game of Thrones. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> in, you know, yeah. That, that would be my comp title. Uh, yeah. uh, a very legitimate one and one that has been extremely successful for the HBO and the Game of Thrones series. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and so if I had to say, you know, somebody was going to pick it up, but I've been told that uh, the missing factor and the business end is quite uh, an action adventure. Of course, it won the Beverly Hills uh, Books Award for Outstanding th- uh, Action Adventure Thriller yeah. in the Last year. That's really good. I, I found it was one of those books that people say you can't put it down. I obviously had to put it down, but it, it kept me very 
interested all the way through, shall I say. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to know what would happen. No. So I can thoroughly recommend that I, to I, listeners. Um, I appreciate yeah. that. Actually, you'd find a... Uh, you'd find a sequel to Business End quite interesting oh, too. Uh, read that, yeah. So, in terms of writing, Dan, um, what does your day look like? I mean, do you write every day? What What's your sort of process for writing? Uh, I do. I write every day. Um, usually, depends. If I don't want to wake my wife, I would just uh, get up around two or three in the morning and spend a couple of hours in front of uh, it. Or, uh, but usually, I get up around five. Yeah have breakfast and then go up and spend from six o'clock to eight o'clock, say. So I try to spend two hours a day, um, seven days a week. Yeah. Oh, so you, you wouldn't necessarily do a sort of half day or a full day. You just limit yourself to a couple of hours. Yeah, I just do it. I, I just feel that I wear myself out. And the fact is that there are a lot of distractions around and things to do. And, yeah. and uh, so, um, and I so I try not to tie myself up. Yeah, and do you find do you plan your books in advance, or or do you do you you know, do you have a rough idea of what you want the book to to say, or, or does it does it evolve as you, as you as you sort of write and travel through it? But a process I use is this: I might have an idea. Maybe it's from my background or where I lived or what I did, or something that will come out of the blue. Yeah. Um, and uh, what I do is I sit down and I jog a couple of, let's say, bullets, you know, yeah. uh, little bullets. This, consider this, consider that, whatever. And I look at it and then I said, and, and then this is what the, the writers call the premise, as you're probably aware, the premise. So I sit down and I write a premise. It's a paragraph, yeah. a, a narrow paragraph or maybe short sentences, but kind of describe a background. Yes. And uh, then uh, I look at it, and then I might embellish it. It won't have that much detail. It just has a bare outline. It, this person did this and this, and this happened, and along it, and it happened at this place. Just the bare facts. So maybe, you know, 10 lines it will start with. But that premise gets expanded. I, I expand those premises. And when I get it expanded enough, what I do is I generate an outline. Oh, okay, yeah. Basically. And uh, now, the outline is the bones, but the, the, the arms and the legs, the limbs, they come as subplots in it and occurs that might, uh, I might anticipate subplots about uh, 10 pages into it. I try to follow acts too. Uh, act one, two, act three, the normal, gen the, the structure for plays and books. And uh, also I follow well-known themes, you know, like if you have a protagonist or a main character, put them through or him or her through hell continuously. Yeah. And it, it has to be an enemy that is overpowering, antagonist. And if you follow those themes, uh, you know, or, or put all these pitfalls in front of them, missteps, uh, you come up with an interesting book. Yeah. Um, what I do is I write the book, regardless of putting the details, like I don't put his eyes, or I don't put the background or the pavement or whatever. I just write the bulk of it, and then I go back. Okay, yeah. Now I start putting the embellishments yes it's a it's a it's a way of doing it that a method that has been used for a lot of successful authors ian fleming for example in a james bond one of the james bond books he wrote a james bond book he says in nine days really yeah what it doesn't say is he wrote the bare bones like i did and then went back and started Misogyny, putting the details in and everything else that made the, the novel. Yeah, you know, yeah. you just can't give out a, a basic structure. You do the premise, you do the structure, and then you embellish it. Exactly. Yeah. I wanted to include everything from the basic of, hey, I, I'd like to get an idea. I have an idea in my head for a writing, but what do I do? Yeah. So I made a table. Okay. 
first thing you should do is before anything is find a sanctuary spot for yourself where you can be uninterrupted and maybe have access to a computer. Yeah. And the next thing, and make sure it's quiet. The next thing is start writing. Doesn't matter that uh, th- this is imperative. Yeah. Start writing and keep writing for a half hour, whatever, whatever you put down, dealing with your ideas. And I put down, and, and instead of having a narrative and saying to the person, here's what you want you to do, I sat down to put a table in there. In, in other words, it's sort of a guidebook instruction. Yes. You do this, do this, do this. And it turned out then I said, oh, you know what? That style I, you can use if you're trying to find an agent. Yeah. Do this, do this, do that, in, in order. Yeah. Then if you're trying to edit or revise the book or or maybe switch genres. So I did that. And, I, and my goal was have something where they could turn and see what the part that they're interested in and follow sort of a recipe, but keep it confined, the whole thing, to 30 pages. Okay. Not a lot manuscript no and so that led me to have eight chapters in there and uh to do that and right now my right my agent who's not who usually sees so many the agency uh, sees so many authors and books coming by she it's a lady and uh she's looked at it and said oh my god this is wonderful my god i could see this being used in writing classes and and everything else. Wow. And I, I was excited over it. I said, hey, how come you don't get excited over my other <laughs> novels? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at any rate, um, I'm hoping that I don't know if it'll come out by the end of the year. I'm hoping. Yeah. But we're in the fall now, and and the agencies, uh, uh, I guess I'm in their queue. But that's how it came yeah. about. That's interesting. I, I was writing articles on uh, writing uh, based, I read a lot, and I believe that a good writer has to learn his craft very well. Yes. Uh, and, and sayings, you know, you know it, it, you, it, to begin a book, read a book. Yeah. If you begin a book in a, in a genre, read novels in that genre. Yeah. Get, start off with something you're familiar with or you've been reading. Also, I present an argument why a writer, to be successful, should be an avid reader of novels. Yeah. And what, what authors do you like to read, Dan? Oh, my goodness. I, I, since I like action adventure, yes. I generally stick to authors that are very prominent in the field. Uh, Lee Child, of course, the Jack Reacher series. I, I'm intrigued, by the way, his attitude. Yeah. Clive Custler who likes to combine the past with the future, yeah. with the uh, Tom Clancy, who I actually knew quite well yeah. and uh, when I was with the State Department. John Sanford, uh, Robert B. Parker, who passed away a, a year ago, and, and I've met the gentleman that uh, helps with his series with uh, Tom Selleck yeah. and, uh, and the movies, and Stuart Woods, Vince Flynn, who passed away and wrote some wonderful books, yeah. and Dan Brown. And actually, uh, I've switched to looking at other things. So, you know, you should learn other things. Would you believe right now I'm reading a lady author that is very prolific called Linda Howard? Oh, really? <laughs> and I'm really impressed, even though the, the heroine, it, it's a heroine, yeah. and uh, she writes very, very well. And doesn't put a John Steinbeck thing where you're putting in the flowery talks and, and speech, and but she does a very good job on yeah. it, and I'm very much impressed by the approach she took, uh, and I can see why she was successful, and I believe she has over 20 uh, novels to her credit. Yeah. So I switch. What you would say to an aspiring author is, is read widely. You should pick novels. It, you, they, probably if they read or they have an inkling, or yeah. perhaps they say to themselves, my God, I just finished this book. I could do better. Or it gives me some idea. You don't have to do it, though. I, I, I wrote up a series, a thing on, uh, on a premise uh, to illustrate it in the novel. 
can I bore you a little by, by reading a, a little a small premise of how this, this writing can start? Of course. Okay, hold on. Yeah. This was, uh, I, I actually put this in the writer's toolbox as an illustration of what it, you could do. Yeah. Uh, so let me uh, go to it right now. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I gave an example in this, and I, I hope I'm not going to be boring you. No, but not at all. <laughs> you're in whose favorite stories, you are, this is my premise yeah. on it, okay? And it turns out that this premise I wrote was three, six, nine, ten, ten sentences. Yeah. I won't go, but you're a young man whose favorite stories are Robin Hood, King Arthur, Pirates of the Caribbean, and Peter Pan. Walking along a busy one-way street, you stop at a travel agency's window and gaze longingly at a poster of a white sandy beach when you spot a shiny coin on the ground. You pick it up, noting the strange depictions. You turn your back to the window when suddenly you're standing in water at a shore. You jam the coin in your pocket as you hastily backtrack onto the dry sand and find you're back at the travel agency with your wet pants legs and dripping shoes. You see, it's a kind of a fantasy thing. Now, it doesn't kind of catch you anything at all. You say to yourself, well, all right, but can, it doesn't seem like uh, there's anything, any great shakes. Uh, so then what happens is you say, well, is there something to make it a little more interesting? Yeah. Okay, suppose now we add another five sentences to it. He was left at an orphanage's front door as a baby with no notes wrapped in a cloth and laying in a strange container of which both are gathering dust in a storeroom. He hasn't noticed yet, but the indentations on one side of the coin match a birthmark on his upper left shoulder. Wow. It, it's, you, you try to put a grabber on Yeah, see? yeah. Uh, now, I have told you, I have said another thing uh, to give an illustration. I went to Seattle. I said, wouldn't it be interesting to write a piece on, you know, how people write uh, pe on private investigators, yeah. you know, Dash Mohammed and, and Carteris and uh, all of those authors, uh, yeah. and of course, Jack Reacher, uh, Lee Childs, Jack Reacher. So I wrote to, went to Seattle to, uh, Think about a premise on a private eye. Yes. Lives on an island off of Seattle. And uh, to get to a business, he has a, a private plane, a, a float plane yeah. on, the, on his home so he can fly. And uh, I wrote a premise on that. Yeah. And I put that in there. And that's how it goes. Yeah. You know, you think, oh, I'd like to write a private, uh, a private eye. So I passed this on to my my uh, agent, you know, and I said, hey, you think an author, do you think a publisher would be uh, willing to put out an advance on a private eye? He says, are you going to go farther than this? I said, yeah, I do have her chapter, the first chapter written. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but again, that's how it is starts. Yeah. Uh, you take an idea, a notion, yeah. and and then you say to yourself, what if? You know, yeah. that's that's how the that, that's interesting. Think, that's that's an interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? Where, where, what if? Yeah. What, what, what if? if? Yeah. So that's that's how it starts. About it. and it starts with person just putting things notes down, whether in a computer or writing it down, just thinking, what if uh, this happened and this happened and this person happened and yeah and you know yeah. Oh, that's 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 a good in, good insight. So, what would you say to somebody who perhaps has thought, I, "I really would like to write a book, um, but I haven't got the time. I'm too busy, and and I don't know how to do it." What would you say to those people? Well, for one, if you want to write, you have to do it every day to start off with. Now, you can start off with fifteen minutes or twenty minutes or a half hour and write something down, anything. Start that way, but. Force yourself every single day at a given time, at a given place, with no distractions, to write. Write something down. It can be anything. Just write. Sooner or later, as you write, something, is, a light bulb is going to go off. Yeah. And, and uh, you're going to say, 
yeah, you know, this is interesting, but suppose this happened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And people watch movies, the TVs, read, and uh, and go to theater, and sooner or later. By the way, I did write a one, a two man play. Yeah, so too. I was going to ask you about that, actually, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you'd, you'd have to once you start writing, you say to yourself, "What else can I do? What else can I expand upon to learn?" So I have been, I also have written two movie scripts, which didn't get anywhere. But I did it just to see if I could follow a format and, and write a thing. Yeah. So same play. I went to the library, had books on how to write a play and, and did it. <laughs> and so you've written two movie manuscripts as well. Are they are they sort of action adventure? Yes, they are. Well, actually I did one based on a mulligan and the other one was the action adventure. Yes. And uh it, but I learned that, in fact that's how I started writing. I went to a movie and I, the movie was so bad, I walked out of the theater with my then wife and, and uh, I said, you know, Jesus, I could do a better job. And uh, Oh, really? She said, no, nobody. They're, they're, they're special people. Yeah. I said but to myself, not so special. <laughs> so anyway, that's how it started. But yeah. then when I went to try to sell it, I met some interesting people like Donald Petrie, uh, who wrote the, the script and and directed the movies for Beverly Cop, Beverly Hills Cop with uh, Eddie Murphy. Yeah. And uh, I went to the uh, I, since I'm in Southern California, I can easily go into Hollywood and went to film festival and meetings and conferences and workshops. And I uh, found out that most producers and directors have their own stable or one or two favorite screenwriters. Yeah. And don't really go out looking for people. And these screenwriters may adapt a novel or whatever. Yeah. So I was wasting my time. So I, I said, hmm, I suppose if I want to get in a novel or something into the movies, maybe I have to do it through the back door. Yeah. Meaning write a novel, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I took one of the ideas I had for a novel and uh, the action adventure. And, yeah. and uh, that's what... Uh, I wrote yeah. uh, the novel based on my script, but the script is a far different animal. You I'm know? sure it is. Um, yeah. And I was really embarrassed because uh, I my books are, as you probably saw, the 300 pages of because I get carried away. I guess <laughs> when I wrote the movie script, I had no idea. I said, "Well, I don't know. Maybe that movie script takes 200 pages, right?" Then I wrote this this movie script, which was about. 150 to 175 pages long. Then I found out going to this class in Hollywood that a page of movie script corresponds to a minute yeah. on the screen. <laughs> so if you want a, 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 an hour and a half movie, you better keep the 100, 100 pages, like 90 pages or eight. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> these revelations occur to you as no, you go I, I bet they do. But no, I mean, it was great, it was great reading the, uh, the Missing Fact. I'm looking forward to reading the follow-up, the, uh, the business end. Without giving too much away, Dan, what, what can I expect from the, the business end? Um, what happens is that uh, uh, the, the Jim Factor uh, goes in home and finds out that that isn't the end of it. Ah. He's going to be coming again. And, and not only that, uh, he is a very much aware that uh, a Russian mafia is still out there, a leader who are after him for killing a member of the, the even though it was self-defense. So um, he prepares his wife. He gets, now I include his wife in oh, okay. that tale. Yeah. He prepares her, and he tells her all about what happened to him, and she's intrigued and says, uh, and he... As you know, he, Adam Weatherly was the private eye she had hired. And uh, then he meets a Chris Muncy, who was a, a martial oh, artist. Oh, so Chris, Chris, and, Chris and Adam are back in, are they? Oh, yeah, excellent. they're back in. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I, should, I should look forward to plus, that. Uh, <laughs> plus Fedorov. Oh, Fedorov's there as well. Yeah. Yes. So uh, they're included, and it, and it flowed really good, and – and at the end, I I did leave a hook, you know, as we say, yeah. uh, to come. 
And as you saw in the um, missing fact of my hook was he looking over his shoulder as he's walking in the house. Yeah, yes, right. Yeah. Well, it, I, I must admit, I, I read it and I, I saw something there about drug cartel. And I thought, no, not another one, because I'd spent lockdown watching all the Netflix, Escobar, you know, all the, the Narcos. I don't know if you saw the Narcos series, did you, in Netflix? And Narcos Mexico. And uh, es- es- about Pablo Escobar and all that. Um, so, you know, it was a whole summer of, of um, action and adventure for me. It was quite interesting. Yes, yes. So um, this has been a great conversation, Dan. Where, where can people find out more about what you do? Uh, I'm on the internet. I have a website. Um, they can see quite a bit of my, my what I do on my website, which is www.danielclordy.com. And uh, my website contains a, a great deal. I also have a Facebook page, Daniel Lee hyphen uh, novelist, that they can consult and, and look at it. And I write a, a piece every day for it, and I keep up. With, I keep that up as part of my writing ritual. It's been a great conversation, Dan. Th- thank you very much. Well, you're quite welcome. Uh, I appreciate you uh, seeking me out. My thanks go to today's guest, Daniel Lorty. This was a great conversation, and I found it fascinating how Dan is able to construct his stories using both his professional experiences, combined with locations and people, and then put them into a what-if scenario. I have read one of his books, The Missing Factor, And if you're a fan of action adventure, I can thoroughly recommend it. You have been listening to Undercurrent Stories. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family. And if you have 60 seconds, I will be most grateful if you would please rate and review. To hear more episodes, please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com. If you leave your email in the link, we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released. Also, check out our social media links, details of which can be found on the show notes. Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best. <laughs>